The University of Louisville empowers students with over 50 fully online degrees and certificates in areas like business, public health, social work, engineering, and more. Flexible coursework allows time to focus on all of life's priorities. Learn more at louisville.edu slash online. From the University of Louisville's Delphi Center for Teaching and Learning. And the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning. I'm Kelvin Thompson. And I am Tom Cavanaugh. And you are listening to TopCast, the Teaching Online Podcast. Hey, Tom. Hey, Kelvin. That sounds interesting. We've got a new intro. There you go. So for those those that are just listening, you... you um, you don't see the video, but this is the first moment I'm actually seeing your new <laughs> environs, and it looks like you still have yet to move in. Although I, there are, I do if see, I was to, if I was to pan around, you'd see the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I see some empty shelves, but I do see kind of a cardinal red, which mm-hmm. is uh, which is kind of cool. I assume that's your your new office that you're sitting. Yeah, in? yeah, that's that's correct. I I, I have two carloads of stuff that. Uh, have been unloaded into the office. Uh, you know, all the coffee mugs and the books and <laughs> the important stuff, the coffee the mugs and the stuff. books. Yeah. That's right. You know how that's how that's how I rolled on. Uh, and so I just got the the shelves b- behind me. I just don't know if the, there's going to be enough shelves. So we're trying to <laughs> find some shelves from surplus and then I will move them around and figure out where they're going to go. And then because I don't want to be unboxing stuff twice. You know how that is. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So any, I mean, it's really hard to ask you this question because you're less than a full five days in, you're like four days in. But any, any impressions? How was the drive? Um, You know, anything you want to share with the top cast audience? Yeah, I mean, you know, Louisville is a lovely city. We're getting to know the, the city, the institution, the campus is beautiful. People are kind. Um, you know, you've been uh, teasing me about the weather for a while. You know, it's really not bad. It's, uh, I looked just a few moments ago. It's 38 outside right now. What is it there in Orlando, Tom? We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, you know, we're getting, getting used to it. You know, you find various moisturizing products to uh, <laughs> keep your skin from falling off. And, you know, there, there might have been the purchase of some additional outerwear and, and so forth. But, uh, but we're getting settled in and, I've uh, been meeting with oh so many people. I just make a general thing of saying, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to probably forget who you are and what you do. So please forgive me now. And so, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, everything so far so good, you know. Good, good. Well, uh, you know, there's a little Kelvin shaped hole in the office at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, we're persevering. And so yeah, wish you all the best. And this is actually the first time I've spoken to you since you've left. Mm-hmm. So we get to do this live on air. That's right. Hey, Tom, how you doing? <laughs> hey, how's it going? So is it like Good. particularly cold there? You said you wanted to talk about the, the all right, weather. We can talk later. about that because it's related to my coffee connection. Oh, okay. Um, which, which is has nothing to do with the subject of today's conversation. It was just oh, okay. more of weather rubbing your nose in it. Sorry. Uh-huh. But it's like 78 degrees. 78. That's cloudless. a 40 degree difference. I was a music major, but yeah. even I can do that math. <laughs> it is uh, pretty spectacular. In fact, it's hot. And um, so I had to have a nice iced coffee for this. Iced coffee. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um yeah, well, I will tell you this. On my first day at New Employee Orientation a few days ago, uh, it's lovely outside, a little breezy, sunny, and uh, you know, I learned a new. I I think I've heard this term somewhere before, but I learned a new term. It was false spring. <laughs> false spring. Psych. False spring. It got That's warm spring. for one day, and now you're back to the slush or whatever. Yeah, and I ran yeah. into a colleague that I had met previously on uh, campus that day and you know oh, hey welcome and good to see you and we we're talking about the weather and she said yeah i remember when i came here for a site visit some many years ago and it was in uh i think she said february and it was a day like that and she said oh, the, the search committee said oh yeah this is this is how the weather is <laughs> <laughs> and she she came you know and she said you're all liars <laughs> <laughs> But it's really not bad. We're we're making the adjustment here. Good. good. Well, I am not drinking a um, a uh, refrigerated beverage, uh, the ye old thermos of uh, 
uh, many a year is, is performing faithfully and is keeping um, said beverage uh, warm. But would you like to know what's in my cup? Yeah, absolutely. What is in the thermos today, Kelvin? Just as Foxtail Coffee Roasters Single Origin Mexico Chiapas Coffee highlights the unique characteristics and flavors of a specific region, ChatGPT's role in digital teaching and learning emphasizes the importance of individualized and personalized education. So, well, how's you, the, I think the coffee's pretty good, but how's the connection? You may have just given it away. Um, and I'm going to say, Calvin, you know, I've heard some some auto speech gen or auto generated speech that's better than what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I assume either you put a prompt into chat GPT to generate yep. the, uh, <laughs> the connection. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what we're talking about today. Yes. Uh, here's what I, I, I wrote it. I, I pasted it just in case you were curious. I said, to chat GPT, I said, write a statement making a thematic connection between Foxtail Coffee Roasters single origin Mexico Chiapas coffee and the consideration of chat GPT's role in digital teaching and learning. And the result is what you got. Yeah. Well, it ain't bad, well, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, wait a second. I don't want to be replaced in my coffee making uh, connection. Coffee connection making duties. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, Open AI's chatbot, um, the, their generative chat. Uh, what's it called? Pre-trained transformer GPT, Chat GPT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was released just recently, mm -hmm. like November thirtieth of twenty twenty two. So at the very end of the year. And oh my gosh, over the holiday break, it blew up. Yep. Everybody started paying attention to it. So, um, you know, we've kind of talked about chatbots in previous episodes, but not like this. Mm -mm. We, we were talking about much more specific sort of use cases for them with like tech support. And mm -hmm. well, and we did touch on the idea of chatbots as like virtual TAs. Yeah. And this is the first yeah. thing I've seen that gets us a step towards that that I think is actually I can kind of see how that could potentially work. Um, so I don't know. You, anything you want to add to that? No. Um, other, yeah, all, all of that. And, uh, you know, we sometimes talk about, uh, I don't know, all kinds of different synonyms, right? Disruptive innovations or um, ripple effect technologies or um, you know, sudden entries into the, into the marketplace or into the field. And, and, you know, I haven't seen anything this sudden in a while and this big of a splash. And, um, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to offend anybody and, uh, you're less offensive than I am. So I'll, um, but I'll say this, I was thinking about this. What would, how would I gauge this? 75 to 80 percent of educators have lost their minds over GPT. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been crazy, and it and we'll get to this, I'm sure, but it seems to fall on on two ends of a spectrum, kind of either, hey, embrace it, use it, or this is the worst thing ever. We have to stamp this out, you know. And <laughs> I've actually had, <laughs> I've had conversations like. At your going away party, I was talking to some faculty, and I kind of I talked to it covered both ends of that spectrum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. people on campus who really feel strongly both ways, and and my gosh, just get on Twitter for five minutes and start searching about ChatGPT and in, in higher ed, and it's you know it's been banned in some places like I think New York City Public Schools has banned ChatGPT, sure. and there are others as well. So you know there's different schools of thought on on what to do with it. This this feels bigger to me than even the whole MOOC craze of 2012. It, it, it's hard, right, to gauge uh, magnitude um, because you know, at the time of this recording, when you were given that date, I was thinking, like I did the math three times. Uh, at the time of this recording, it's been less than two months. <laughs> Yes. And it feels like it's been out for 
six months to a year, uh, the way yeah. there's been yeah. so much activity and talk. And so I, I just, I do wonder uh, whether there will be the same kind of sustaining um, effort, power, you know. Um, but yes, right now, if you were to gauge the beginning of the MOOC craze and, and yeah, this feels bigger. I, I agree. I don't know if it'll sustain. I, I do. This probably gets ahead of things a little bit, but I imagine that some difference would be made uh, when, if, and how the owners of chat GPT uh, start charging for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It feels like that's inevitable. Um, I read somewhere, I forget the number, I should have looked it up, but it was, it was multi billions that it's been, yeah, it's been capitalized at as far I as saw investment. That. Yeah. I want to, yeah, I, I saw that. I think I looked yesterday, uh, at something in preparation for this and I, I, I don't, this may not be right, but it was something like $290 billion valuation of the company. Yeah. It you know, was something, something like crazy that. like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's going to, this going to be monetized <laughs> at some I point. So. <laughs> yeah. At some point. Um, so I think one reason why maybe it's bigger than MOOCs is because MOOCs was very much kind of, it was the online world encroaching into the face-to-face -face traditional world, but it was still the online world. Yes. This thing cuts across like Everything. the whole institution. Everything. And it's not just higher ed. No. It's like life. It's yes. instituting. That's right. That's right. Now, I know this uh, from not super recent, but past conversations. You've you've enjoyed playing with Chat GPT a bit. <laughs> I have, so yes. why don't you tell us some of some of how your new hobby of Chat GPTing has played out? Yeah. So I mean, in addition to kind of the usual things of like I'm just putting in prompts that I think an academic might put in in a mm -hmm. course to see what you get, and I've been mm -hmm. kind of remarkably surprised. I've been shocked at just mm -hmm. I thought how coherent <laughs> mm -hmm. and and decent these essays were. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be you know, winning any dissertation awards, <laughs> but, but for like regular undergraduate essay writing, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like some people know I have a sideline hobby of, of fiction writing. I've written a couple of novels and a short story or two. And, and so I've been prompting it to write short stories and, um, what it comes back with now, I've, I've been intentionally being a little, you know, campy in what I've asked for. So it's not like I'm getting, I think, any great literature back. But it does it. Mm -hmm. So like, so I write mystery novels. And one of the ones I put in was like, write a mystery short story in the style of Raymond Chandler where the cat is the killer. I think that's exactly what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And it did. It comes back with several hundred words with clues and red herrings and Mr. Whiskers, which is a name it made up all on its own for the cat. Yeah who did it and you kind of didn't quite see it coming and I I was I was kind of surprised yeah and another one that I've done <laughs> for those who are fans of the office and uh, parks and rec there are these characters within characters in the show Michael Scarn is the secret agent for the office played by um, <laughs> by uh, Steve Carell's character so it's a character playing a character. Um, and then um, Chris Pratt's character in uh, Parks and Rec has this alter ego, Burt Macklin, FBI. And I always wanted to write a fan fiction where Burt Macklin, FBI special agent, teams up with Michael Scarn, secret agent, two completely clueless characters acting ridiculous in the most hackneyed, campy, spy secret agent thing. So I had ChatGPT write me a short story about the team up of those two characters. And then I, I tuned it to get it even better. I had it add dialogue, add, um, you know, uh, more uh, cliches. Um, it, it came up with a crime organization. I said, name the crime organization, the syndicate. So they did that. And it was hilarious. There was even a point so, you know, <laughs> language warning, folks. Um, there was a point where the Michael Scarn character turns to the to the Burt Macklin character and says, you know, they they won't be able to, to reach us because of our sheer badassery. 
you know, badassery is what the, the chat GPT came up with. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Now, for those who haven't um, played with, uh, experimented with chat GPT yet, uh, when you say tuned, I assume you mean you put your initial prompt in, you got the response, which is, can we just talk, talk about that for a second? Amazingly fast. Yeah, like seconds. I yeah. mean, maybe not even. I mean, yeah. and it kind of goes, you know, just kind of, you know, just, just spits it out. Um, just processing power, right? And then when you say tune, you mean, okay, there's that. Now I'm going to add this, like, call it this, yeah. add this. So you just revise your prompt and then you, you see what kind of a, kind of a. a That's a, right. An yeah. And in, in a get. more academic context, I was meeting with somebody, one of our potential vendors, um, and <clears throat> he was showing me some things about it that, and, and he's got a product that is, you know, you can detect if somebody's mm -hmm. used it to write essays. But it was interesting because as he was demonstrating it to me, it was one of the first times I had actually seen it, like mm -hmm. first week of December or something. Mm -hmm. And um, he was tuning it too. So he put in a prompt about, you know, something academic. And then after the essay was written, he said, well, use metaphors mm -hmm. or make it um, more appropriate for a, a middle school audience or something. And then it changes it. It, and it changed the types of metaphors it used to explain this concept. Mm -hmm. to, it was comparing and contrasting two different things that had the same name but were very different. And I was really impressed because it did use metaphors. And then he had to you know, include two citations, scholarly citations, and it did. Now, that is one of the criticisms I've heard, that sometimes the citations it finds mm -hmm. are not real. Oh. I actually had <laughs> somebody at this going away uh, party mm -hmm. tell me that they got some they put they've been playing with it and and the citation that it saw was from somebody that they know so they they actually know the person who was cited mm -hmm. and he knows that that person never wrote that thing wow but chat gpt was smart enough to know mm. that that was a guy that should be cited for yeah. this yeah. but it was like a, it wasn't a real article huh. so it's interesting that is that is interesting. Those are those are great. Uh, I think I've told you my two favorite uh, examples. One is semi education related, and the other is just sheer survival. Um, <laughs> let's do the latter first. Uh, before I moved, you know, I we're not big, um, you know, gastronomic geniuses at, at my house. Um, although we're really good at ordering out. Uh, so, you know, who knows what's in the refrigerator any, any given week. And, uh, I ran across, you know, there's all kinds of stuff on Twitter and I'd run across and once, you know, here's my favorite thing. Try this. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll try that. And it was give chat GPT the ingredients of your refrigerator and ask it to create, uh, recipes. So <laughs> this, this will give you uh, very, very vulnerable on my part, insight into the uh, refrigerator at <laughs> our house. It's at ketchup and expired that. ranch dressing. What can you do with that? Well, it's a step above that. But it, <laughs> it was indeed um, uh, chicken tenders, spinach and artichoke dip, non bread, and beer. <laughs> and darn if it didn't spit out something like three or four little recipes. Uh -huh. And, you know, it was creative in its, um, like one of them I remember was, I mean, I could, I could imagine doing it, right? You, you make some kind of like a little quesadilla out of the, mm -hmm. you know, you use the non bread and, and you put the stuff together and you, you know, kind of quick, quick little heat it up in the uh, saucepan or something. And, you know, and there was some other kind of spinach and artichoke dip coated tenders. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it was like, huh. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. there's, call that creativity or don't call that creativity, but it, it got me out of my own yeah. rut in thinking, right? As a, yeah. as a starting point. And the other uh, that was interesting, we've, we've heard a lot of criticism about how learners could take advantage of this, uh, call that good, call that bad. Um, but on the flip side, 
I, I think I mentioned this to you. Um, I stole this idea from somebody else on Twitter, but the prompt went something like, teach me subject X in 52 weekly lessons, create a, a syllabus, a uh, list of readings, and supporting resources, and start with day X, right? And I did that changing out um, kind of your tuning thing, changing out the subject matter and changing out the day, right? So a hypothetical 52 lessons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would get whatever the topic, you know, I'd day 37, it's this. And, and you know, I'm not saying that what resulted is, uh, is going to replace any faculty necessarily, but there was a reading, there was a, an additional, like usually like a, a video that you might watch or something like it, uh, in addition. And there was, um, uh, you know, a, a topic that was addressed. And then it would also include like a 10 question quiz, which you'd have to kind of come up with yourself. But, you know, I would hope that nobody would just take that and use it as is. But as again, as starter dough, it yeah. wasn't a bad thing. And I could even say things you might appreciate this. As I was tuning, I said, uh, use only open licensed content, you know, and, and it did. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. I, I actually see an awful lot of utility <clears throat> in this tool. Um, and I was saying to somebody that if I were a junior associate attorney in a firm who was responsible for like doing research and writing briefs, I'd be a little nervous right now. I'd be trying <laughs> to find some other value I could provide. Um, you know, and I'm even thinking the courses that I teach at UCF, like the main one that I've taught the last couple of years has been a, a writing for the business professional. It's basically a business writing course. And I have the students write adjustment letters and instructions and, you know, memos and all kinds of stuff. Good grief. This thing could do that in a matter of seconds, probably just as well as what they did. And I'm kind of thinking, well, if they have access to this, why do I need to teach it? Because I'll, I'd rather focus on more, you know, higher level concepts and, you know, writing, you know, responsive proposals for something as opposed to, you know, just an adjustment letter to a client that you've wronged in some way. Mm -hmm. I think that, that this could actually help us elevate the, the level of what we're teaching mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways. So, I don't know, maybe we should kind of talk about uh, talk yeah. about how students are, are reacting to it and, and how we should <laughs> potentially respond, although recognizing that it's still very early days. Well, um, maybe the latter first, because uh, I think your example put me in mind of, we talked about this a little bit before, our friend and colleague, Dr. Kevin Yee at UCF's Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning, um, put up a, uh, a web page in, uh, in your web space that we'll put in the show notes where he classified like th three different kinds of uh, approaches that one might take. He was trying to be kind of value neutral, I think, but three different kinds of approaches one might take as a faculty member uh, toward GPT, uh, chat GPT, and uh, then categorized uh, resources related to all three of those. And the last one makes me think of what you were talking about with your your uh, attorney uh, kind of situation, mm -hmm. right? Which is, and, and kind of what we've leaned uh, into in this conversation, which is lean into the software's abilities. Like, don't see this as a threat, see this as, a, as, as something to harness and something to build upon. Um, I, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I think that's the, based on my observations, that's the, sort of minority perspective right now. I agree. I don't I agree. see as many people doing that. Although I think within our community, I'm not sure it's a minority perspective. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people I sort of follow and yeah. interact with, yeah. I think yeah. kind of yeah. are, are on that side of the spectrum. That's I right. think the rank and file faculty are much more on the, this is the worst thing that's ever happened yeah. end of the spectrum. The end of days, and yeah. which gets us to um, a lot of folks who are concerned with Kevin's category number one was neutralize the software. So all kinds of approaches and tricks and whatnot to 
work against around <laughs> the affordances of chat GPT. I guess sort of like you, you talked about a, um, a company, right. That was making a tool. I've seen certainly a lot of, uh, detection approaches. Home I'm aware of at least three right mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. two from companies and one from some kid at Columbia that just <laughs> right, did it, I think, exactly. and faculty have started adopting it. That's and I'm right. sure there's more. Mm-hmm. The second uh, category I do find interesting as well, though, and that is, and I don't think that all of these are necessarily mutually exclusive, but Kevin's category two is teach ethics, integrity, and career-related skills. That could go hand in hand with lean into the software's abilities. Yeah, I agree. Although just teaching ethics, I think, is hard oh, because yeah. you're either you either believe in that or you don't. And that's right. There are an awful lot of instances of academic misconduct that yeah. happen on every campus, everywhere. Right. That even at service academies where there's like really strong honor codes, mm-hmm. um, it still happens. So. Yeah. I like the idea, though, of of the career-related skills. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, so you want to be this thing? You want to be an accountant or something? Well, if you use ChatGPT, it's going to actually prevent you from learning what you need to know to mm-hmm. be an accountant mm-hmm. or a nurse or a doctor or whatever it is you need to be. So you're, you're actually working against your professional ambitions if you do this in this way. Mm-hmm. That, that I think that might resonate with with students maybe a little bit more. But on the flip side, I mean, back to your, however you phrased it, your your kind of junior, you know, paralegal or attorney or whatever, right? It's okay. You need to be able to perform this skill, but if you use this tool, you can do that more efficiently. You take the output and you tweak it. Yeah. You know, and I keep thinking. I wonder, I mean, like how different, I mean, I understand it's, it's qualitatively further down this spectrum, but I sort of feel like it's on the same spectrum as tools like Grammarly or, um, you know, spell check or grammar check. I mean, I get, as I type, I have, I get things suggested to me that finish my sentences for me. And I either, I can just press, you know, you know, enter or tab or whatever, and I the word finishes my sentences for me. Right. So That's this right. seems like it's it's just taking that a little further. Yeah. Um, PowerPoint. What do they call it? Design ideas. Yeah, I love that. I do too. Right. And it's like I'll, I would have never thought to zoom in on this little area and add this little. Nor sure. would I have been able to. Like, I right. would not have dedicated the time to change right. my PowerPoint template to resize right. the image and right. you know put the border on it and everything else that it does. Yeah, it just makes it better. So is that unethical? You know, uh, is that Kelvin or Tom taking credit for some, you know, machine, you know, creative idea? Nobody talks that way. Yeah. Nobody talks yeah. that way about that. Well, and this is probably, we don't have time to really explore this in the couple of minutes we have left, but you know, within the, the kind of fiction writing community, mm-hmm. uh, I've seen some, some stuff about the ethics of using chat GPT or other generative, mm-hmm. you know, chat-based kinds of, you know, writing <laughs> producers. Um, and not just the ethics of selling that as fiction, right? If it's decent or not, but if it's been if it's been taught based on the writings of others. So, say Kelvin Thompson has written a series of romance novels for Harlequin. How did you and, know? Yeah, and um, this this chat tool has been tuned and taught based on you know, instantly analyzing the entire library of Kelvin Thompson. And then you've been successful and you say, write a, a romance novel in the style of Kelvin Thompson. And it does. Well, w- is that a copyright violation on you right. and right. your work? Right. It's not something that you wrote, right. but it's kind of stealing your style. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of gray areas that are going to be explored yeah. in the courts, I think, in the years to come. Yeah. And, and, and not even just legality, but just, again, back to ethics, back to propriety, back to social norms, 
you know, what is it to do? You know, I keep thinking about, um, like you said, we don't have time, but, you know, I think of, you know, Star Trek was so innovative in so many ways, right? And there's the famous uh, book, Hamlet on the Holodeck and, and so forth. But so many times where technology is modeled as doing a lot of scaffolding, like computer, devise a, a, a typical mid 20th century house environment, swap out the couches, change the color, da, da, da. add three characters of white, right, and then no, and then convey a scenario and then and then you add your own little creative elements to it. But you didn't hand code all those things no, in some no. Paris or what Lieutenant Paris, whatever. So this is really stretching our thinking about what the the value add of the truly human really is. Well, can I end with a really dystopian thought? Oh, why not? <laughs> so let's kind of project 20 years in the future okay. in our profession of online okay. learning. Uh-huh. So we've got, we've got AI that can write content mm-hmm. that is organized, researched, and um, a, a course's worth of content. I don't think we're that far from it today. Mm-hmm. But let's project 20 years in the future. I think it, it's probably completely realistic to expect that that could be like, I want a course on business writing, Mm -hmm. go build that. Mm -hmm. It could probably do it. Mm -hmm. We've got AI art now Mm -hmm. that is producing like full gorgeous comic books, Mm -hmm. completely developed by computers. There was a, uh, uh, some stuff that made the rounds on Twitter of a guy who used chat GPT and a voice emulator and had no human interaction and got a $12 refund from Wells Fargo on his bank account just by using the voice prompts, Mm. which is terrifying. Um, And that just happened. And then we've got these deep fake, like you can't tell it's not a human being, like AI Mm. persons. You combine all that together, you could just put a prompt, build an online course. I want a female African-American professor in her 40s. I want the art in the style of Art Deco, 1940s kind of. And then it'll spit out an online course that's probably good. Like, so where are we and the faculty we support adding value in this? I think we're going to have to really pay attention to that. I think that's great. And, you know, humorously, I'll say, and then if you had about half of the enrolled students, if they were just uh, phoning it in and, and having their own AI uh, responding to them, you could have one AI teaching, you know, yes. <laughs> yes. half a class full of other AIs. <laughs> well, uh, it's like the, the Wells Fargo thing. So it was like an AI voice, you know, prompt system was talking to this guy's AI voice, you know, GP, chat GPT, and real money was moving around. Yeah. It, it was no humans talking to each other. Very strange. It's, it's like something right out of a, you know, some sort of like, you know, cyberpunk novel. Now, with that in mind, I cannot not invoke what I seem to recall as uh, Kathy Davidson from uh, Haystack's uh, famous quote from a few years back. I want to say it was in a inside higher ed piece or something. Seems like I've seen it quoted before, and I hope I've got the citation correct. But speaking of herself and others, like, you know, because people get have always gotten bent out of shape about technologies uh, usurping uh, faculty roles. And she said, look, if, if we can be replaced by a computer in this role, perhaps we should be. If, that's, if all we're adding is something that could be easily emulated by a computer, what are we really doing? So yeah. always be looking for the affordances of the truly human, I think. Yeah, and I think that, you know, maybe as a way to kind of close this up, um, you and I are both on the end of the spectrum, I think, where it's lean into it. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, it's a losing battle to try and Absolutely. hold back this tide. So yes. let's surf it the best yep. we possibly can. Yeah, well said. So would you like me to try and land the plane here? Please do. All right, so technological innovations like chat GPT are tools that we can harness to benefit student learning or not, <laughs> if, as the case may be. Mm-hmm. And it's up to us as digital learning professionals to lead the way in being adaptable and innovative in all of our approaches. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well said. We'll, we'll monitor this, right? And we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. We'd love to hear from folks who uh, have differing opinions. You know, we'd love to bring a counter perspective uh, to bear in here, but 
you know, we, we've got to be paying attention. I think that's right. Do you think we've, we squeeze in a plug before um, the plane uh, takes off again? Yeah, we're already over time. Let's squeeze it in. <laughs> well, dear listeners, if you like what you get out of these TopCast episodes, would you please be kind enough to tell a trusted colleague and invite them to listen? And then just maybe you discuss the topics together. Word of mouth recommendations are a slow but steady way to increase our listenership. So Especially on you topics please? like this. That's right. That's yeah. right. You know, have a beverage and <laughs> those guys are idiots. I'm not having any <laughs> chat GPT in my class. <laughs> Well, Tom, I'm sad that I was not able to share the cup of coffee with you, pour it out into your cup, but I'm glad we were able to get together and have this collegial conversation over our individually poured cups of coffee. There you go. And until next time for TopCast, I'm Kelvin. And I'm Tom. See ya. See ya.